uh, writing down the maybe our central theorem from last time, and then we'll we'll carry forward. So uh, throughout today, G is going to be an abelian group. I'm always going to use additive notation, although uh, once or twice I may um, sort of. put this on hold for a moment and consider what happens in the non-abelian case. All the theorems we prove are going to be in this setting. And I'm interested in taking two subsets of G, which will be finite and non-empty. And I'm going to be interested in their sum set. <clears throat> Name, which is the set of all elements you can get by adding something in A to something in B. And uh, the, the general questions we're interested in are, one, how, how small can this sum set be? And second, if it, if it is small, then why? If it is small, what can we say about the structure of, of A and B, and, and, and possibly even the, the group? Um, so last time we had this very important theorem due to Cauchy and Davenport. It says that if P is prime and A and B are subsets of so ZP for me, this is the this is Z quotient PZ. This is the cyclic group of order P, um, and these are non-empty. Then the size of their sum set is is pretty large. In fact, it's at least the min of P and size of A plus size of B minus 1. Right, so again, um, <clears throat> what's happening here? Well, certainly the size of the sum set can't be larger than P. Right, so sort of what this theorem tells you is that when you add two sets, the size of their sum set, it's always at least the sum of the sizes minus 1, unless that was, that was a ridiculous thing to hope for, because that's already larger than the whole group. And in that case, you get the, the whole group in the sum set. And uh, we as well had uh, a theorem that I, I mean, I didn't do the details of, but uh, a theorem, <clears throat> and this is due to Vosper, that says, well, and I'll, maybe I'll say this without the C right now. If A and B are subsets, said P, um, And their sum set's not everything. And the size of the sum set equals the sum of the sizes minus 1. <clears throat> uh, then this can only happen for one of a couple reasons. Effectively, either, I mean, the, there's a sort of trivial reason here. that one of the two sets could have size 1. If one of the, my two sets has size 1, then the size of the sum set is just the size of the other set. Um, there's, there's a third set. If you remember last time, we introduced the third set C that was the complement of the opposite of A plus B, and we learned that that played a similar role. And so there's, there's another conclusion here that the size of the sum set is actually equal to P minus 1. And I, I'm, I'm not going to go back through it, but in some way this, this condition really is just like one of these two conditions. Um, and it's kind of a triviality. Uh, the other interesting case is that A and B are both arithmetic progressions with a common difference. So in other words, you can write, in other words, A is a set that looks something like 
say little a plus i times g, or even I could, why don't I even use less notation? Little a, sorry, you could write the set a as a, a plus g, a plus 2g, on up to a plus m times g, and you could write b as b, b plus g, so on up to b plus n times g. <clears throat> and in this case, what's happened? Well, now, a is going to be an arithmetic progression of length m plus 1. b is an arithmetic progression of length n plus 1. In this case, when you add a and b, you're going to get a new arithmetic progression, right? You get a plus b, a plus b plus g, and the biggest term is going to a, be a plus b plus m plus n times g. <clears throat> so you can see this is an arithmetic progression of length m plus n plus 1. So you're, uh, you're, you're hitting this, this lower bound. Uh, OK. So what I'd like to do now is talk uh, a little bit about what happens when we generalize from this group mod uh, prime, group of integers mod a prime, to a general abelian group in both of these cases. And, uh, <clears throat> and both of these theorems have nice and very sensible analogs. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the um, uh, Oh, let's see. Oh, actually, and then what I'd like to do is is kind of even roughen this up. So here, you know, I mean, here, what, what's happening in this case is we're we have this we have this kind of very sensible lower bound over here, and we're we're really asking what are the interesting examples that hit that lower bound exactly, right? So we're going to uh, we're then roughen this question up a little bit. Instead of trying to hit hit that lower bound precisely, we're going to look at sets that that have fairly small subsets in some sense and, and look to get the structure of them. And uh, so the, the, um, the, the significant theorem we'll prove today is a theorem uh, due origi originally to Ruja. And this gives you a structure theorem for what a subset of, a, of say, Z mod 2 to the D. So if I give you a subset A of Z mod 2 to the D, and you add A plus A, and that's small, relatively small, then we'll, we'll get a structure for that. So uh, anyway, so that's where we're headed. So we're, we're sort of I'm, I'm aiming towards some of these rougher theorems. But, uh, but at the start, let me, let me do a couple precise ones. So, um, <clears throat> so again, Cauchy Davenport gives us this very natural lower bound on the size of a subset when our group is uh, just the integers mod a prime, and Vosper characterizes when we hit that, that tight case. Um, did, did, I, did I write up Knazer's theorem last time? No, I, don't remember. No. I don't think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, OK. So, <clears throat> so there's, a, there's a very important generalization of Cauchy-Davenport to arbitrary abelian groups that's due to Knazer. Um, there, there are lots of, well, there are lots of, there are at least a few Knazers. There's Adolf and Helmuth and Martin, and this is Martin, if you're keeping track. Um, anyway, so we're in the same setting. A and B are now subsets of this group G, and I'm interested in giving a natural lower bound on the size of their, their subset. So here, A and B are just subsets of G, and again, A and B are finite and non-empty. <clears throat> Now, uh, well, maybe I should just ask. So, so over here, what happened? If I added together two sets A and B, either you got this natural bound that we saw with arithmetic regressions, or if you didn't, you got, you got the whole group. I mean, could I hope for the same thing over here? I mean, could it be the case that when I add A and B, either the size of the sum set is at least the sum of the sizes minus 1, or you, you just got the whole group?
is G arbitrary group? Yeah, G is just meant to be an arbitrary abelian group. Any abelian group you like. So, oh, the thing that's going to get in the way of this, this same kind of bound holding, is, is other subgroups. Right? I mean, suppose you have a, a, an abelian group G that just has a finite subgroup H. You could take both A and B to be that, just that subgroup H, and then when you add A and B, you just get H again. So you're, I mean, you're, you're way off of this sort of bound, at least if H is non-trivial. Um, so somehow, if we're going to generalize this to abelian groups, we're going to have to take subgroup structure into, into account. I mean, that's, that's sort of the missing ingredient we need. And there's a, there's a very sensible way to do that. Uh, <clears throat> what I need is what's called the, the stabilizer. So if I give you a subset, this is of my abelian group G, the stabilizer of, of A is a set of all group elements so that when you add that group element to A, A comes back to itself. So the stabilizer of A, this is the set of all group elements such that A plus G equals A. <clears throat> right, so, uh, well, we defined this last time. I guess it's not quite on the board. But this set, A plus G, you just add the, the singleton G. I just won't, won't bracket it. Um, so the stabilizer of, of A is the set of all group elements so that when you add them to A, it just comes back to itself as a set. So, uh, okay, so what's the key feature of the stabilizer? What, what property does this, so the stabilizer is some subset of the group. It has, uh, thank you, yes. Right. So the stabilizer is always going to be a subgroup, right? If I give you two things in the stabilizer, if G and G prime are in the stabilizer, then it's, it's immediate from this that the sum will be 2. And same thing, if, if G is in the stabilizer, then the... the sorry? Uh, yes, right. So the identity is included, and it's closed under, uh, op uh, under opposites, right? If A plus G equals A, I can subtract G from both sides of this equation, and I learn that minus G is also... Right? So the stabilizer is, is always a subgroup. <clears throat> um, in, in words, the stabilizer of the set A, it's going to be the maximal subgroup with the property, it's so that's, say, the maximal subgroup H with the property that A is a union of H cosets. Right? So I mean, if, if the stabilizer of A is the subgroup H, then A, just, A is just a union of H cosets, right? Because <laughs> if you take any element in A and shift it by anything in that subgroup, you have to come back to A. Uh, so it's going to be a union of H cosets, and it's going to be the, the, the maximal group with that property. Um, so over here, what we're going to do is we're going to take into account the, the, the subgroup structure. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to define H to be the stabilizer of the sum set. <clears throat> and then what's true is that the size of A plus B is always at least the size of A plus H plus B plus H minus the order of H. And now I don't need any funny min condition or anything like this. This is just automatic. So let's, uh, <clears throat> let's see what's going on here by verifying that this generalizes Cauchy-Davenport. Right. So if you take the group G to be just the integers modulo the prime P, well, as we've remarked, I mean, H is going to be a subgroup. I mean, H doesn't have a whole lot of options. It's a subgroup of ZP, right? So it's either the whole group or it's trivial. If H is the whole group, well, that means your sum set had to be everything. And, uh, um, and so then you're, getting, you're going to get this, this first conclusion here. <coughs> uh, if H is trivial, then the size of A plus B is at least the size of A plus the size of B minus 1. So it hits that bound uh, on the other side. 
Um, <clears throat> so, uh, let's see. Right, so last time I gave a proof of Cauchy Davenport. If you remember, the, really the key ingredient in that was this simple property that <clears throat> oh, I, uh, maybe this isn't such a great place to write. This is a bit auxiliary anyway. The, the key property was that the, if you take the pair of sets A and B and you replace them with the intersection and the union, then the, the sum set of that intersection and union is always a subset of the original. And, and, and uh, again, this is, this is very easy to prove. If you have a, an element x in this set, an element y in this one, y had to come from a or b, say it comes from b, well x was in a, so you see x plus y over here as well. Right, so the same thing happens uh, uh, the other way around. Um, so that, that basically permits you a kind of inductive foothold. And uh, and Cauchy Davenport, you really get just just applying that that induction. So you you kind of take your sets A and B, and you can uh, um, well you have a little bit of freedom. You can shift the sets. You can replace A by A plus some fixed element G. <clears throat> and uh, by shifting your sets, you could then then apply this argument. So uh, I, I'm not going to give the, the proof of Knazer, but, but what I want to say is it's mostly the same. Um, this, this same inductive foothold, well, OK, I should say um, uh, the original proofs are not the same. Um, so the original proofs use some more complicated kind of transformations. But there's, there's a fairly easy proof uh, along these lines that um, uh, um, uh, well, I, I will give it to you in the notes. I mean, it's, 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 it's my own argument, but it's just a variation of, of some of the other. I mean, it's sort of a simplification of some of these earlier ones that came before. But, uh, but basically what you do when you go to prove this, you take your two sets A and B. You know that you're free to, to shift them. You try to shift them so that this intersection is, is a, a proper non-empty subset of A. And that allows you to apply induction. The only thing that kind of goes wrong is that when you apply induction, the stabilizer is changing. And that makes things, so that means sort of when you apply induction, you don't get everything you want immediately. But anyway, so let me not say anything more about the proof of that. Is there an efficient way to compute the stabilizer? Can you do that efficiently? Uh, I know that's kind of outside of this topic, maybe, but. Um. <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really don't know. Um, let me just let me just say um, Kemperman. So Kemperman solved the characterization problem of finding those sets uh, A and B, <clears throat> which meet this bound with equality. And more generally, Kemperman uh, uh, gives a structure theorem for when uh, uh, the size of the sum set is less than the sum of the sizes. Um, let's see. Yeah, you know, I have a few minutes. Let me, I, I, I think, let me kind of, um, let me give you some further detail about what those things are going to look like. So it's, it's sensible and it gives us a bit better understanding of this bound. Um, uh, 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 oh, yeah, first, let me say, so, <laughs> yeah, so a project that I've been involved in for a really long time is a further generalization of this guy to the non abelian case. And uh, so next week, uh, we'll give a colloquium talk, and that will be the focus of this. So um, uh, what, what sort of happened here is for, for groups of prime order, Cauchy Davenport give you this nice lower bound, and Vosper characterizes the tight ones. And for abelian, uh, Knazer has this very nice lower bound, and Kemperman gives you this um, characterization 
of these, uh, these sets with small sum set. In the, in the non-abelian case, uh, in the non-abelian case, there isn't such a nice bound like this. We don't have a bound. Uh, I mean, there, there exists some theorems with similar structure, um, but they're not nearly as meaningful. And uh, uh, that, makes, that makes this characterization problem a little bit more messy. Uh, but nevertheless, it's tractable. And, uh, and at any rate, so I'll be describing this problem for non-abelian groups uh, uh, in that um, in that colloquium next week. Uh, for now, let me tell you let me tell you a bit about what happens in the abelian setting. <clears throat> so we know a couple of well, we know one kind of way to make us a, uh, a small sum set here, which is two arithmetic progressions. And another one is to take one of the sets to be a singleton. <clears throat> now, there are, there are some simple ways to kind of take those structures and sort of blow them up. So, uh, uh, for instance, suppose that instead of having an arithmetic progression like this, I have like a progression of cosets. So I have H and H plus G and H plus 2G. So let me let me draw some pictures over here. So I'm going to I'm going to be drawing a picture here. This is this is intended to to be uh, showing you the structure of G quotient H. So this is the whole group G and I've got it chopped up into the H cosets, right? So maybe this is H and this is H plus G and this one's H plus 2G and so on. <coughs> and uh, and now I'll show you what A looks like. So here's the set. The set A is going to be filled in. In pink here. All right, so if this is what A looks like. And I give you a B that looks pretty similar. Um, Right, so A is just a, it's, it's a progression of H cosets. It's a coset progression. And B is a similar progression of H cosets. Then what happens when you look at the sum set, <coughs> A plus B, Well, I'm going to get a similar coset progression here, only with 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 four, right? I mean, this was a uh, well. In fact, <laughs> we're sophisticated people. We can quotient out by h, <laughs> right? Well, if you quotient out by h, then you see an arithmetic progression of length three here, and a similar uh, one with the same difference of length two here. When you add those, you get a progression of length four. And all I've done is I've you know inflated these by h. I mean, really, all that's happening here is, is that same arithmetic progression structure, and you just see it when you quotient out by h, right? And, and even, I mean, you could see our, 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 our bound here is giving you that kind of structure, right? Here in this, in this line, a plus b is a union of h cosets, and a plus h is a union of h cosets, and so is b plus h, and so is this. So everything in the picture here is just a, a union of H cosets. And if you were to just quotient out by H, then you'd be seeing this size of A plus size of B minus 1. Right? So what, what's, what's really happening in this bound is that same kind of minus 1 thing that we see with the arithmetic progression, only you're getting it, you're not seeing it quite in the original, you're seeing it after you quotient out by H. <clears throat> So this is, this is one possible structure. You can see as well, I mean, the other, the other structure that we had here, I could take A to have size 1. Similarly, I could take B to be any set of H cosets and A to just to be a single H coset. And you'd, st you'd still get this same, uh, the same property that everything in the, in, the, in the game here, A and B and A plus B are all unions of H cosets. 
And when you quotient out by H, then A would have size 1 and B would be whatever, and they'd be hitting that, hitting that bound. Um, so, uh, uh, so in words, you can really see these same, same two structures, but just after quotienting out by something. That's perfectly sensible. So it might be that there's a subgroup H, so that when you, when you quotient out by it, this is what you see. Uh, only there's another thing you can do. <coughs> and, uh, well, and, and this is why Kemperman's theory, theorem it, itself is actually rather tricky. <coughs> you see, I've got some room to spare here. Right now, the size of this sum set is smaller than the sum of the sizes by the order of H. Right, I've actually got quite a lot of room to play. Suppose, <clears throat> suppose I were to take, instead of taking that whole H coset, I just take a little piece of it here. And same thing over here. Instead of taking this whole H coset, I just take a little piece of that. Maybe I'll, I'll call this piece A1 and I'll call this piece B1. Now, you can see what happens when I add these two together. The, all of the elements here come from adding something in this coset plus something in this coset. Right? So over here, I get a little piece that looks like <clears throat> A1 plus B1. So what's happened is, well, I've I mean, you see we've, over here on the left, I've got three full H cosets, and I've got A1 and B1. And over here on the right, I've got three full H cosets, and I've got A1 plus B1. So what's happening now is, well, if A1 and B1 had that small subset property, right? If the size of A1 plus B1 was smaller than the sum of their sizes, then this is going to be a new construction of a, of a bigger pair with that same property. Right? So I'm, 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 I'm right now I'm, I'm focusing on sets that have this property. Right? I'm interested in pairs of subsets where the size of the sum set is less than the sum of the sizes. I sometimes call those deficient. And I'm interested in understanding the structure of these deficient pairs. And what I'm showing you here is a particular recursive way of constructing some deficient pairs. Right? So if you gave me a deficient pair a1 and B1 in the subgroup H, I could form one in, a, in the larger group by taking a, a progression that looks like this in A and a progression in the same, pro I mean, similar structured progression in B, and then the size of their sum set will indeed be less than the sum of their sizes. This will give you a deficient pair in the big group so long as this was a deficient thing in the small one. And actually, you can, you can play the same game. So, one of our structures was arithmetic progression. The other structure here was having a set of size 1. <clears throat> now, if I told you that the whole of A was just this little A1, A, A just lives here, and over here for B I give you a kind of random looking, random looking bunch of H cosets plus B1, <clears throat> And then when you add these guys together, uh, oh, oh, that was meant to be there. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't do the best with. Well, okay. So if uh, if your set A one lived in this subgroup H, and B has this structure. It looks like a few whole H cosets plus part of one. Well then again, when you, when you add these two together, you're going to get a, an H coset in the sum set corresponding to each of these guys. And, uh, uh, and then there's going to be one, so you'll get a bunch of whole H cosets, and then you'll get one partial one. And so long as this smaller pair was, uh, was deficient, this gives you another structure. And so, roughly speaking, what Kemperman's theorem tells you is that if you have a pair of sets that satisfy this inequality, then 
then that pair of sets has a kind of recursive decomposition using these two structures I've just shown you down, in, down to the, the basic forms, which are the arithmetic progression and the set of size 1. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to say that in any further detail. Um, but uh, yeah, there's this funny story. So uh, Kemberman's theorem is really complicated. I mean, the, the statement of it is 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 a little bit delicate to get right, and um, what 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 actually happened with this is that in Kemperman's original paper, um, he never quite declares here is the structure. He gives a somewhat complicated looking theorem, and then in the text on the page following it, he explains how this somewhat complicated looking theorem can be used to derive the full structure. Like, I mean, he, 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 kno he knows the theorem. This is his theorem. No, there's no doubt. Only um, somehow that got lost over time. <laughs> so it turned into an unsolved problem. Like this appears <laughs> as an unsolved problem, for instance, in, in Nathanson's um, yellow book on, uh, on additive number theory. It, uh, and and uh, um, Hammy Doon, who was one of the people that did a lot of this work, considered this an important unsolved problem, uh, and and you know was promoting it as such. Uh, only, I mean, it was really solved, but but people just didn't know quite what Kemperman had done, and it was very complicated. Um, what so, year is this? Uh, fifth, it was just a f oh uh, yeah, uh, it's in the fifties. Oh. So it's uh, yeah later in late in the fifties. So Knazer's theorem is I think fifty. Three and uh, uh, Kemperman is maybe like 56 or 57. Yeah. Any rate, uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, my, so my, uh, my exposure to this was somehow I, I, I started working on the conjecture <laughs> of classifying these things for abelian <laughs> groups. And, um, uh, and <laughs> upon solving that conjecture, I learned that it had been solved 60 years earlier. <laughs> anyway. <rate>, um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so I mean, this so the uh, the details here I'm I'm definitely sweeping under the rug, but the the kind of the moral here is is that those basic structures we have of arithmetic progression and the the, the singleton those are really the things that lead to small small sum sets. We're going to see that play out in a couple of different ways. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me do. <clears throat> Okay, so, um, so we've been looking at this really extreme case where the size of the sum set is less than the sum of the sizes. Now what I'd like to do is, is back up and, and ask what, what a set looks like if, it's, if the, the sum sets that we form are small. And now I'm not going to be quite so insistent on that. I'd like to be a little bit rougher. And this, uh, this is a... <clears throat> meaningful direction that was first developed by Freiman <clears throat> and uh, we'll start back in the integers and I'll start with a uh, so before we we saw that if you have two subsets of integers that satisfy this then either one of the two sets is a singleton or they're both arithmetic progressions so Freiman considered taking just a set of integers and adding it to itself so what we know is if you take a plus a, so if a is a subset of integers and you add it to itself, the size of a plus a is always at least twice the size of a minus 1. And you're going to get equality if and only if a is either size 1 or an arithmetic progression. And I guess I don't need the first conclusion there. <laughs> size 1, any set of size 1, I suppose, is an arithmetic progression still. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> So now, so that was when the size of a plus a is at most twice the size of a. Now I'm going to roughen that up a little bit. So uh, this is Freiman's 3k minus 3 theorem. <clears throat> Freiman has a large number of, of theorems. He was, I mean, he was like almost 40 or 50 years ag ahead of everybody else in doing this. And uh, he has a, a whole lot of different theorems that are known by um, some parameter of this form. Uh, this one I need uh, a, a little help just to get the plus minus ones correct. <clears throat> oh, 
oh, I should add another bit of notation. So um, if if A is a subset of the group G, I'm going to let and 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 M is a, a positive integer. I'm going to let M t M times A <coughs> denote the set you get by adding A to itself. M times. So 2a is just a plus a. <clears throat> so his theorem tells you if this is at most twice the size of a minus 1 uh, plus b, which is less than 3 times the size of a minus 3. <clears throat> so I'm giving you, oh yeah, so for, for, <laughs> there won't, won't be any k appearing in my statement here perhaps. So b is just going to be some integer. Uh, but the, I mean, the, the key assumption right now is that twice the size of a is less than 3 times the size of a minus 3. Then <coughs> uh, a is a subset <coughs> of an arithmetic progression. of length at most size of a plus b. <clears throat> so what's happening here? Well, so if I give you a whole arithmetic progression for a. a is just 0 up to 100. Then 2a is going to be, you know, basically arithmetic progression with the same difference that's almost twice as long. Now, well, that's going to get me a set with extremely small uh, doubling. That's going to give me a set A where twice the size, of, where twice A is very small. But if I wasn't interested in in hitting exactly twice that bound, suppose I'm interested in doing something rougher. Well, if, if instead of giving you this whole set A, I were to randomly delete, say, ten elements, right? The the size of that sum set, uh, the the size of the new sum set, the size of the new two A, it it certainly can't be larger than this. So you're still going to get a set with small doubling, right? So if, if, I, if I take a set A where you know, twice A is small, but then instead of giving you that whole set, I throw out a little bit of it, I'm still going to have a set with a fairly small, uh, 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 with fairly small doubling. And what's, what's happening here is he's telling us, <clears throat> he's, he's telling us at least if, if the size of our sum set is only is less than three times the size of the original minus three, then in fact this is really what happened. Then really there was a there's a fairly compact interval, right? A is a subset of an arithmetic progression of this length, size of A plus B. And uh, so really what happened is you kind of had a little arithmetic progression and you threw out a few elements, and that's going to give you a fairly small sum set still. <coughs> now uh, <clears throat> so now we're seeing uh, I mean, we're seeing a new feature that's going to be much more present, especially when we're we're kind of roughening up the bounds that we're interested in. Uh, um, let me show you that that this theorem is tight, and this so this three k minus three really is a magical number here. So now what I want to do is I want to consider a set A which is a union of two intervals. Say, uh, I don't know, 0 up to 20 together with uh, 100 up to 110. <clears throat> so what's A looking like now? Well, A is, A is really a union of two arithmetic progressions that, that have the same difference. But they're kind of far apart, right? They're not really interacting. What happens when you 
double this. <coughs> well, you can add the smaller interval to itself, and that's going to get you the interval 0 up to 40. You're going to get some elements in this doubled set by adding something in the small plus something in the big. <coughs> that gets you 100 up to 130. And you get some elements by adding something in the big interval to something in the big interval. Uh, which gives you 200 up to 220. <clears throat> right, so this, this double here What is it looking like? <clears throat> this doubled set is uh, oh boy. okay. So this this doubled set is now a union of three intervals. And how 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 big is it? Well, if if let me sort of do this in general. If this int was an arithmetic regression of length m, and this was one of length n, then the small one here is going to be two m minus one. This is going to be m plus n minus 1. And the big one over here is going to be uh, 2n minus 1. So the whole of this will be 3 times m plus n minus 3. All right? So this is, a, this is a set of integers, a, which, which no longer needs to compactly fit within one interval. Right? And when you add it to itself, the size of your sum set is 3 times the size of the original minus 3. Right, so so this, this statement would be extremely false if you, if you uh, uh, weaken this just by one. Right? Because I mean, these guys aren't interacting at all. Right? I can spread these guys extremely far apart. What's happening here is that, uh, well, we've got, we've got kind of a break. We've found a different structure that's leading us to a small sum set. <clears throat> now, uh, for Freiman, this was really just the tip of a very big iceberg. Uh, uh, what Freiman proved is a rough structure theorem for subsets of integers that have roughly small doubling. <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I can't write it all just yet, or I'm going to need to talk about it for a minute. Uh, but he's interested in taking a subset of integers that's again finite and non-empty, and he's going to assume that the size of this, oh, I've been using, oh, I just stopped using my notation suddenly. Let me bring it back. The size of twice a is at most t times the size of a. <clears throat> Then, and he's going to give a rough structure theorem. So he's going to give us a theorem that tells us something about the structure of the set A. Um, <clears throat> and what's that got to include? <clears throat> so let me let me just talk about this. Is I'm going to talk about this sort of casually as being small doubling. So a set has small doubling if twice the size of that set has only gone up by a constant factor. Okay. Now, if I give you a set that has small doubling, right? so say twice a is less than t times the size of a, then instead of taking that entire set a, I could just, I could just take half of the elements. Right? Just randomly select a subset of half of the elements. And that new set will still have relatively small doubling, right? Because that new set, A prime, when you add it to itself, you're still going to be trapped inside the original sum set. So I'm going to get a new set there that still has small doubling, although maybe the, the t got a little bit worse, but not that much. Right? So that's one thing we're going to be able to do. And that, that's something we're seeing, we're seeing already here. Right? Instead of taking the whole interval, you could, you could delete a bit of it. You still get sort of small, small doubling. The other structure here is what we're starting to see in this picture. Now, more generally, instead of taking this set, I could take
you take something that looks like this, so what's going on here? So I've got an arithmetic progression here, and then I've kind of shifted it by 100, shifted it by 200, uh, shifted it by 300. I've got a kind of progression of progressions. Right? What happens when you add this set to itself? Well, you're, you're going to get a new set with the same kind of structure, right? When I add <coughs> this set to itself, I'm going to get 0 up to 40. And then I'm going to get 100 oop, up to 140. And so on, on up to 600, up to 640. Right, I've got kind of a progression of arithmetic progressions, and it still has this small doubling property. So <clears throat> more generally, you can kind of, you could then take kind of like a progression of these guys <laughs> and a progression of those type things. And that now it starts getting a lot easier to just write it using set notation. <clears throat> So I'm going to think of uh, uh, I'm going to think of well, like an arithmetic progression, just an ordinary arithmetic progression. I would take a plus say j times b, <coughs> and I'd let j run from zero up to n, right? So this is describing an arithmetic progression. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to give you a few of these. So here I would now let j1 <coughs> run from 0 up to n1 and j2 run from 0 up to n2. But more generally, I could let ji run from 0 up to ni. <coughs> let me just give myself a little bit more room. So what do I have here? This is called a generalized arithmetic progression, right? And you can see what's happening. I mean, the, the parameters b1 up to bd are, they're just fixed integers. So a is a fixed integer. But now we're letting the coefficients of each of these terms vary over some, uh, some little interval like this. Now you can see what's going to happen. If I take this set and add it to itself, you're going to get a new set that I could describe with the same structure, right? If, if I take this as my set A, then what's 2A look like? Well, you're going to have twice that A. And now I'm going to get a, a very similar looking thing, only my, my terms here, my Ji terms, are going to be allowed to run basically twice as long. So what's happening here, now I'm ignoring some complicated questions about when you get the same term appearing here. And I'm going to kind of continue to ignore those things. But let's just, let's just for the moment imagine that all, whenever you plug in values here, you always get distinct terms. I mean, if that were true, then the size of this set would just be the product of the sizes of these ni's. Or, well, maybe plus one, the way I've written it. And the size of this would be, well, the product of twice the ni's. So you would be going up by a factor of about 2 to the d, where d is the number of, uh, uh, of these terms. So this is what's known as a d-dimensional arithmetic progression. And Freiman's amazing theorem tells us that if you have a subset of integers and it has this small doubling, then a is a uh, um, let's say there exists some delta bigger than zero and and d such that a is a delta portion of a d dimensional arithmetic progression. And when I say delta portion, I mean 
take the original arithmetic progression and just keep a keep delta of it, right? So delta is some delta is going to be some number that's smaller than one. So in instead of taking the whole arithmetic progression, you could take only ten percent or only five percent. And uh, and and th this is uh, anyway, so this is a grand grand theorem. What's happening here is this is <clears throat> this is what's called a rough structure theorem. And let me let me try and say precisely what I mean by that. So Freiman's theorem tells you if you take any set with this small doubling, of course this delta and d depend depend only on t, not on this. I, I guess I should have maybe said that. I mean these things aren't allowed to depend on a. <laughs> so for every t. Yeah, for every t there's that yeah, maybe I should. Let me just put those at the top. <laughs> For all t, there exists delta greater than 0 and d such that. <clears throat> so in other words, you're going to fix that t parameter. You're interested in subsets of the integers a, so that the size of a plus a is at most 100 times the size of the original set. Right, so we're looking at sets that have that doubling factor, say at most 100. Then Freiman's theorem is going to tell us that every such set is a bounded size portion of a bounded dimensional arithmetic progression. And uh, <clears throat> this is a rough structure theorem in, in what sense? Well, if you take any set which is a bounded size portion of a bounded dimensional arithmetic progression, then it will have small doubling. Right? So this is giving us a kind of, you know, some kind of nice qualitative understanding of what it means for a set of integers to have this small doubling property. If you have small doubling, then you're a bounded size portion of a bounded dimensional arithmetic progression. If you have this kind of structure, then you are going to have small doubling. So those things are roughly equivalent. Now, uh, what we'd like is we'd like for them to be, to be reasonably sharp. And they are not. So you could sort of say, well, I have a set with this small doubling. That tells me it has this structure. It has this structure. Well, that tells me I have small doubling for some other parameter t prime. You would like for that t and t prime to be, um, to be close. Uh, uh, only they're not. They're, 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 they're exponential. And uh, a f I mean, a really, really fabulous open problem is to, is to improve upon that. Um, <clears throat> now, let me, let me sort of do, geez, okay. I'm going to do a teeny bit of talking about how this generalizes, and then, and then we're going to have to do a lot of proving when we come back after the break. So, um, so Feynman proved this theorem in the 50s. And it, it, by and large, fell on deaf ears. Um, you know, uh, I mean, he was writing these, these papers in Russian journals, and there wasn't a, uh, I mean, there wasn't a, a community there that was picking these things up and doing much with them. Um, Imre Ruja rediscovered this in the, in the 90s. And Ruja found uh, new proofs of Freiman's theorem, really. Uh, uh, taking advantage of some different techniques, some Fourier analysis. Uh, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful blend of kind of combinatorics and, and, and some analytic ideas. And uh, so Ruja found new proofs of these things, and then they absolutely took off. So um, then all of a sudden there were people that found immediate and, and, and profound applications of these things. Um, so like uh, um, this, like Freiman's theorem appears in the, in the heart of, of, of Gower's proof of Semiretti's, well, sorry, of Gower's, so Gower has, has many proofs of Semiretti's theorem, so I have to be more <laughs> specific. Uh, Gower's has a proof of Semiretti's theorem that follows the, the line of Roth's original argument uh, uh, using a kind of density increase argument, and that leans very heavily on this. It, it, it appears in many other places in kind of this world of additive combinatorics. So it really took off after that. Um, and, uh, uh, and in fact, now it's been generalized in every possible, well, in nearly every possible way. So there's a version of this 
So this is just subsets of integers. You can ask what happens in abelian groups. So that's a theorem due to uh, uh, Green and Ruja. So they have a, a, a similar classification. And it's very similar sounding. Like it's, it's, it's basically exactly what you'd think. Instead of saying <coughs> bounded portion of bounded dimensional arithmetic progressions, you just have to say, except you might be talking in terms of cosets. There might be some subgroup involved, and you're, you're really only doing that after seeing that after quotienting out. <coughs> Um, even more recently, it's been generalized to arbitrary groups. Um, so there's a very powerful theorem due to Brouillard and Green and Tau that, that I mean, has, well, roughly speaking, it's telling you what a subset of an arbitrary group with this kind of small doubling is. And that's, I mean, that's starting to get extremely complicated. Um, I, 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 I don't... I don't understand that. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I, I mean, it, it goes, I mean, there's like non-centered analysis and Lee theory. I mean, there's a lot of very, there are a lot of amazing ideas that are very far from uh, uh, anything that I understand uh, that, that, that govern that. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do after the break here is come back and address this problem in the easy case where our group, well, easy but still complicated. In the easy case when our group is uh, uh, an abelian group with the property that every element has bounded order. So like Z2 to the D right, or something like that. So some abelian group where, that, where I've got a strict bound on the order of all of the elements. Now in that case, you're, you don't have any arithmetic progression type structure here. <clears throat> so you, you should only have subgroup structure getting in the way. Uh, um, and uh, uh, at any rate, so we're gonna we're gonna establish that theorem. That'll be the the what we do in the next hour. The um, I mean the this is a it's as you'll see this is really pure combinatorics as we know and love. It's like intersection union and induction, and and it's still waiting to be improved upon. So <clears throat> I was saying Freiman's theorem. We, like we have this nice theorem, but we'd like it to be sharper. And the, the, so the theorem I'm going to give you is, is this in, in, a, well, in a slightly different setting here. But, uh, but even that one, the, the last word has yet to be written. And I consider this a fantastic combinatorics problem. So, uh, okay, so why don't we take like about a 10 minute break and then, uh, and then I'll come back and, and do this theorem of, of Ruja. <coughs> 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 <coughs>